Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. For a time in the 1930s, Myrna Loy was the biggest star in cinema. Dubbed the Queen of Hollywood, she ruled the box office and the big screen with her dark charms. Yet when the cameras stopped rolling, Loy's life was anything but a fairy tale. How Myrna Loy refused to obey labelling and became the Queen of Hollywood instead. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Myrna Loy, who refused to play the Hollywood game. A big star in the 1930s, Myrna Loy blazed a trail for Hollywood actresses. It's ridiculous to assume that national politics shaded every aspect of Hollywood thinking. But considering how rigid the studio system was when Loy reigned during the 1930s and 40s, her steadfast refusal to play the game is worth noting. Despite her patrician airs and delightfully upturned nose, Loy was, by Hollywood standards, a flaming liberal. A confidant of Eleanor Roosevelt's, she fought constantly with Louis B. Mayer, the legendary Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer studio chief who was critical of Roosevelt. When the Hollywood Reporter, then a right-wing bastion, condemned her political activities, Loy sued the influential publication for $1 million. Her feisty spirit continued into the 1980s, when she sharply criticised Ronald Reagan at a time when most members of Hollywood's old guard considered the president a hero. During the 1960s she was asked about the nostalgia craze that swept the country. Her answer was typically forthright. The so-called fabulous 40s were horrible, she said. When you look back, some of those years that seem so nice now were quite miserable. We were building up to the McCarthy era in which careers were shattered. All that fond nostalgia, all that sweetness and light. It wasn't all like that. It's not surprising that while other actresses of her era relied on mannerisms, Loy's acting style was as straightforward as her lifestyle. But in those days, mannerisms often passed for talent, another reason she was slighted by Oscar. Myrna Loy, best known for films such as The Thin Man and The Best Years of Our Lives, is one of the most iconic actresses of the 1930s and 1940s. There's just something about Myrna Loy movies, isn't there? A stellar actress in both the most dramatic and comedic pieces to come out of the 30s, Loy has captured audiences' attention and love for decades upon decades. She was so popular that in 1936 she was named Queen of the Movies and Clark Gable the King in a nationwide poll of moviegoers. Loy was often promoted by her studio as every man's dream wife. Loy was born Myrna Adele Williams to Adele May and rancher David Franklin Williams in Raidersburg, Montana, a small town near Helena. She was of Welsh and Scottish ancestry. Loy's first name came from a train station whose name her father liked. Her father was also a banker and a real estate developer, and the youngest man ever elected to the Montana State Legislature. Her mother studied music at the American Conservatory of Music in Chicago. Myrna Loy took dancing lessons and at the age of 12 made her stage debut at Helena's Marlowe Theatre. She performed a dance based on the Bluebird from Rose Dream Operetta. After her father's death in 1918, the family moved to California. She was a student of Venice High School. Myrna Loy left school at the age of 18 to work at Grauman's Egyptian Theatre. She performed in musical sequences that served as prologues to the feature film. She was noticed by Rudolph Valentino and was hired as an extra for Pretty Ladies with Joan Crawford. She had a small role in What Price Beauty, and this led her to sign a contract with Warner Brothers. Myrna's first experience in front of a camera was, by her own admission, a disaster, and Valentino quickly lost interest in her. Valentino's wife, however, was convinced Myrna had a future in pictures and cast her in a film she was herself directing. What Price Beauty, an odd and awkward fantasy film set in a beauty parlour that failed to find a distributor until four years later, in 1928, when it predictably flopped at the box office. 
Loy appeared merely as window dressing in a red velvet tunic and black pants, but it was enough to whet her interest in film work. Quitting her job at Grauman's, she became such a persistent inhabitant of various reception rooms at MGM that the studio finally gave her a bit part in the chorus line of its 1925 Ziegfeld Follies film Pretty Ladies, and used her as a live mannequin in a wardrobe test for its upcoming production of Ben-Hur, which was to be an early experiment in colour filmmaking. Makeup was unnecessary, but Loy appeared in full war paint anyway, and attracted enough attention to land another bit part as one of the hedonist handmaidens to a Roman senator in the picture. By now, friends were suggesting that her chances might be better if she changed her name, there being too many actors called Williams in the business already. A writer friend, much taken with the nonsensical sound poems of Gertrude Stein, came up with Loy as a suitable complement to her first name. The headshots Myrna sent to Warner Brothers was signed with the new name, which seemed to work its magic when the studio offered Myrna Loy a contract in 1925 at $75 a week. Loy's fear of limiting labels was amply justified for the next six years. She was condemned to a dreary series of B-pictures, in which she was typecast as the sensuous, mysterious and often treacherous foreign femme fatale of vague Asian extraction with such names as Yasmini, Nubi and Farlo Si. She was the native girl who ruins the career of an innocent young American sailor in Across the Pacific, a Hindu princess in the Black Watch, outfitted in silk pants, a halter top, and a strange black wig that one reviewer thought made her look like a weird cross between Cleopatra and the goddess Kali, and a gypsy in the squall in which she arouses the passions of a group of naive farmers with whom she takes refuge during a storm. Loy personified the foreign vamp for American audiences. She broke out of this screen mould with her role as a wise and worldly paramour torn between a rogue gambler, Clark Gable, and a straight-laced attorney, William Powell, in Manhattan melodrama. Loy frequently collaborated with Clark Gable on films, and the macho actor shared a little-known vulnerable side with her. As she revealed in her memoirs, they would read Shakespeare and other poetry together late into the night, after filming was done. According to Loy, he loved poetry and read beautifully with great sensitivity, but he wouldn't dare let anyone else know it. She and Powell again teamed to portray the husband and wife detective team of Nick and Nora Charles in The Thin Man, an enormously effective screen partnership. Loy and Powell appeared in 13 films together, often as the witty, sophisticated, martini-loving Charleses or as characters not far removed from them. Loy's screen persona appealed to men and women. She evinced equality in a male-dominated world, or at least emerged wiser and more level-headed than her male counterparts in roles that called for her to be the subservient spouse, and her combination of beauty and brains made male audiences regard her as the ideal mate. She was called the perfect wife. Men must marry Myrna clubs were formed. Franklin D. Roosevelt claimed her as his favourite movie star. Another ardent fan, John Dillinger, broke cover to see her in Manhattan melodrama and was gunned down, leaving the theatre. Even my best friends never failed to tell me that the smartest thing I ever did was to marry Myrna Loy on the screen, William Powell once said. The Thin Man was the turning point, followed in quick succession by a number of sparkling comedies, such as Wife vs. Secretary, Libeled Lady, and several Thin Man sequels. By 1936, she was voted the number one box office star by US theatre owners. It all made Loy frankly uncomfortable. Labels limit you because they limit your possibilities, she once wrote. At the height of her popularity, she took a leave of absence and left for Europe, complaining that MGM was paying her only $1,500 a week whereas Powell was making twice that. After a number of legal threats, her contract was revised and the studio awarded her a $100,000 bonus. 
After The Thin Man Goes Home in 1944, Loy left MGM, promising to return only for the detective series. The warnings to young women to stay home, both because Hollywood was a dangerous place and because it was simply too full for actresses, began to appear in both the American and international press. For their part, the fan magazines used a direct address approach to young women who might be tempted to go to Hollywood and try for the movies. The message and tone changed completely in their address to these readers, from detailing the steps one needs to take to forge a film career, to printing articles of cautionary tales from actresses and telling young women directly to kindly stay home. Magazines scolded the movie Mad Maids, who would inevitably end up at the mercy of the overtaxed Los Angeles social welfare system when they were penniless. The fan magazines also printed interviews and letters from celebrity actresses, telling new young women to be smart and to simply stay away. In an interview with Luella Parsons, actress Ruth Stonehouse said she felt like telling every girl to stay at home because the profession is crowded now. It will be survival of the fittest. The Atlanta Constitution declared that 10,000 girls go to Los Angeles every year to become a star in the movies. The cultural mood was perfectly encapsulated by the titles of two silent films at Warner Brothers over a five-year period, starring young Myrna Loy and reaching box office success. 1921's Why Girls Leave Home and then 1926's Why Girls Go Back Home. Myrna was crowned Queen of Hollywood in 1938, with 20 million fans casting their votes in the largest poll of its kind ever conducted. One of Lloyd's trademarks was her pert, upturned nose. Film critics called it a wonder of nature and a plastic surgeon's paragon. In the 1930s, scores of young women begged their doctors to give them Loy's profile. In 1924, she was the first woman to appear on screen wearing trousers as an article of feminine clothing in what price beauty. But her trend-setting style and wit wasn't really appreciated until the Thin Man films, which enjoyed a huge popularity. In talking roles, she had a great voice, clear and genteel, with a steel quality. She was voted one of the top ten most bankable movie stars in 1937 and 1938, but gave it all up during World War II to work closely with the Red Cross. During World War II, she worked with the American Red Cross and later served as a representative to the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. UNESCO. Loy appeared on screen less frequently after the war, dividing her time between acting and political causes. She was an officer and advisor of the National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing and was a member of the Committee for the First Amendment, a group of prominent Hollywood actors who protested the actions of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. After the war, she returned to Hollywood and gave measured, detailed performances. Nevertheless, she still delivered excellent performances in such well-received films as The Best Years of Our Lives, The Bachelor and The Bobby Soxer, Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House, The Red Pony and Cheaper by the Dozen. Myrna Loy was one of cinema's brightest stars, beautiful, talented, warm, witty, wise and urbane, in her later years, Lloyd toured extensively in stage productions and occasionally accepted character roles in films. One of her final roles came in Just Tell Me What You Want, a middling comedy made worthwhile by Lloyd's scene-stealing performance. Though she was never ever nominated for Best Actress in her 125 film career, in 1991 the Academy voted her an honorary Oscar for a lifetime of achievement. She was too ill to attend. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Myrna Loy?